We can finally put all of these things together into determining how electrons are organized in atoms and ions. And we call this the ground state electron configuration of atoms and ions. Simply what that means is that if I have 10 electrons in my atom or in my ion, how am I going to organize those electrons in a way that creates the most stable atom or ion possible? So there are several rules to keep in mind. The first one is just the sequence of the orbitals and how you put your electrons in. You always want to start with the lowest energy orbitals first and then going to the higher energy orbitals. So the specific sequence follows this arrangement which is you start with 1s, goes to 2s, goes to 2p, and then 3s, and then goes to 3p, and then 4s, and then goes to 3d, 4p, and 5s, etc. So what I always tell students to do is to write these columns out of S, P, D, and F, and then mark them as 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 7 for S, 2 to 7 for P, 3 to 6 for D, and 4 to 5 for F. And then just start drawing those arrows down to remind you that that's the sequence which orbitals comes first. This actually is called Aufbau principle, which is just the German word for filling up. So the idea being that we're going to start from the lower energy orbital to the higher energy orbital. This guarantees that whatever electron configuration we come up with is the ground state or the most stable electron configuration possible. If you have four electrons, for example, you're going to put it in 1s and then you're going to put the other two in 2s. You're not going to put it in 1s and then put the next two in 3d because that would not be the most stable or ground state electron configuration. We then have the Pauli exclusion principle which just says that each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons. So if you have one orbital like in the 1s orbital and all you can do is put two electrons in there, you can't can't jam in three electrons because if you do that then the third electron is going to have the same quantum number as either the first or the second. The last one is called Hund's rule and this describes why orbitals that have identical energy which are degenerate orbitals when you fill out these orbitals you have to separate the electrons out first before you can put them together and it's actually well illustrated by this example of carbon right here. So if I put these two electrons in here I can either put them together in one orbital uh, or I can put them in separate orbitals like this. Uh, what Hunt's rule is telling us is you have to separate them out because if you put them together they are less stable than if you separate them out due to electron-electron repulsion. So that's the three rules that we want to keep in mind as we're writing our electron configuration. Now many of you have done this in prior courses so I just want to do a quick review of how to represent electron configuration. There is many ways to do this. The first one is to do it using this notation which is called the SPDF notation. So this is carbon. Carbon has six electrons in the atom state so that means we have six electrons to organize. Where should my electrons go? Well it starts with 1s and then 2s and then 2p, 3s and so on. So each orbital can accommodate two electrons. So the 1s can have two so we would write it 1s2. The 2s can have two as well so we'll write 2s2. The 2p can actually have six orbitals. So if you recall the p orbitals there's three different orbitals, three different orientation for the same level. So it can actually accommodate six electrons but in this case we only have two left so we're going to say 2p2. If you want to be a little bit more precise about the location of those electrons you can say 1s2, 2s2, 2px1 and 2py1. This highlights the importance that you're actually separating those electrons from each other. The orbital diagram is a third way of doing this which is when you draw these boxes with arrows that are pointing up and down. The arrows pointing up and down represents the actual electron. We either upspin or downspin. 1s orbital can have 2, 2s orbital can have 2, and then the 2p orbitals can have 6. So there's three different orbitals in here. That's why there's three different boxes. And then the first two orbitals right now are filled with one electron each, and the third orbital is empty. There's also a fourth way to write this electron configuration, which is for larger elements. You can use something called a noble gas shortcut. In this particular example, if I have magnesium, magnesium is 12 electrons, so I would go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s2. But really that first three orbitals, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, is the same as the electron configuration of neon. So what I can do is just say neon and then 3s2. So you would write it like this, okay? So that's just what we call a Nobel gas shortcut. So that's the fourth way you can represent electron configuration. There is one exception that I want to note here about the transition metals. One of the issues with the transition metals, which are elements in this group, 
right here is that they all have their valence electrons in the d orbitals and the s orbitals that it's following that. So they're very close together in energy and a lot of times it's very difficult to know which specific orbital is going to be filled and which specific orbital is not. I want you to actually memorize these two exceptions right here and the exceptions having to do with chromium as well as copper. So chromium and any elements following below chromium and then copper and any element following below copper. For chromium if you just go with the standard rules for writing electron configuration you would say that the configuration is 4s2 and 3d4. 4s2 right, right here and then 3d4 because there's four elements after that but it actually is incorrect. When we do the experiment we find that the electron configuration of chromium is actually 4s1 and 3d5 argon previously so, so it does have all those inner electrons as well. So the point here to note is that don't write this AR3D4 4S2 as the electron configuration for chromium but write this. Keep that in mind. The exception actually only happens to chromium and molybdenum which is the element below chromium and then afterwards below that is tungsten and that exception disappears there due to the size of tungsten but I just want to make sure that you remember this exception. For copper is sort of the same idea. It's supposed to be AR3D9 4S2 if you follow the standard rules for, for writing configuration but it's actually AR 3D10 and 4S1. For this one the reason is because when you fully fill that 3D orbitals it actually makes that a little bit more stable compared to having the 3D partially filled like this with one more electron that's needed. So that is what the element uses in terms of its electron configuration. Another important idea about transition metal is when you write the configuration for ions. Okay so these are for atoms right now for ions. So remember that with transition metal they tend to form cations so they lose electrons right now they don't lose electrons in a way that we thought they would based on some of these configuration so when you look at the way we fill in the electrons we always fill in 4s first and then 3d which tells us that the 4s orbital is more stable than 3d orbital and that's correct when they are empty so this is the key word there 4s is more stable than 3d when they are empty but once you fill them with electrons the stability is actually flipped so 3d becomes lower than 4s so when you want to remove electrons to form ions you have to take the electrons from the highest n value orbital first so that means taking it out from 4s first before 3d despite the fact that 3d is filled in before 4s so when they have electrons these orbitals don't have the same relative stability as when they are empty so this is something to really pay attention to because a lot of times people would forget. Let's talk a little bit about the electron configuration and the periodic table. If you understand how the periodic table is organized and the electron configuration of the different groups of elements in the periodic table, it actually makes it really easy for you to come up with the electron configuration of any elements in the periodic table. In this particular version of the periodic table, it's been color coded so it's showing the valence shell of the specific element and so everybody with the same type of valence shell has the same color. So if these first two groups, group 1a and group 2a, along with helium, has the same type of valence orbital, which is all s orbital. If you actually work out the electron configuration, you'll see that their valence orbitals are s orbitals. When you look at the elements here, these six elements that are on the right side of the periodic table, they all end up having valence orbitals that are both s and p, but it's the p that that is being filled in. These here would be d orbitals as I mentioned earlier for a transition metal and then these lanthanide and actinide series actually have them in the f orbital. So again there are four different blocks. This is called the s block, this is called the p block, d block and f block and that just makes life a little easier when you have to determine configuration. If I tell you determine the electron configuration for tin because you know that it's in group 4 and it's in period 5 and in this case the p block element if automatically you know that it's going to be 5s and 5s will mean that you have 4d because the d is always one lower than the s and then that one would be 5p so it'll be 5p2 since it's group 4. So 
you can see that that's exactly what that says there in, in smaller type. And the rest of it is just going to be the same as the electron configuration of Krypton, which is the noble gas that comes before tin. Another thing to note here is the number of valence electrons. So group 1a all have one valence electrons. Group 2a all have two valence electrons. Group 3a all have three valence electrons. You can see it here with boron 2s2, 2p1. So when you add those together, you get three. This one has four, 2s2, 2p2, so four electrons, etc. So the group number actually corresponds to the number of valence electrons. Group 7 right here, you have seven valence electrons. Group 8, the noble gas, has eight valence electrons. That's true for the main group elements. Now for the transition group, it's not as easy because it's a combination of the S and the D together. So it's a little hard to know that and it's not as predictable. But the main group elements, which is the group 1a, 2a, and then 3a all the way to 8a, their behavior is a lot more predictable and they have those specific valence electron numbers. And that later on becomes very useful in helping us to predict their chemical reactivity. So this is a question about electron configuration for both an atom and an ion. And they're both for gold, start with a periodic table and look up where gold is located and how many electrons gold has. So gold is down here and it has 79 electrons. Remember what I said uh, in lecture is that you want to narrow down and determine where the configuration should end. Gold is a D block element. So that tells us that the last orbital that you're going to fill is the D orbital. And then the next thing is we look at the period. The period here is period six. And that means you're going to start with 6s. And the D orbital is always one number less. So it's going to be 5d. So gold is going to end in 5d. And it's just a matter of how many electrons we're going to have to count it. So here's the electron configuration starting from 1s and all the way to here where we have to go into the 6s. Don't forget that once we get into 6s, this lanthanum species right here then jumps to this series of 14 elements going with cerium and so on. And that actually is 4f14 before we go to the 5d. So if we just write it, we would count the d here. There is nine elements, so that means nine electrons to gold, right? So 5d9. Now here's where you want to remember that 6s2 and 5d9, that's an exception. Gold is right below copper, and so it's the exception that exists with copper, which means we have to rewrite it, and we can rewrite it as follows. This entire thing right here, from 1s2 all the way to 5p6, that's just xenon, so we can just write it as xenon, and then 4f14, and 5d10, and 6s1. So what I've done is I've made 10 for the d, and then 1 for the s, because that is one of the exceptions. Now notice the other thing I did here is I rearranged this to write it with 4, 5, and 6, with the 6 being the one that is written last. Because remember that once you fill the orbitals with electrons, the stability of those orbitals change. So now the 6s is actually the least stable orbital compared to the other ones. And so when you want to write the electron configuration for gold 3 ion, you're going to write it as xenon 4f10, and then you're going to remove three electrons, right? You're not going to take it from the 5d, you're going to take it from the 6s first. So take that one electron from the 6s, and then once you take that one out, you have to take two more from the 5d, leaving you with 5d8. So that would be the configuration of gold 3. So don't write this. You know, sometimes I see this. I should say 4f14 there. 4f14 and 6s1 and 5d7. Okay, so if you do this, this would be wrong. Because remember that when the orbital is filled with electrons, the stability changes. It's no longer the same as when the orbitals are empty.